Wine, who's the head of the Community Security Trust of Britain, will be speaking. He's a very interesting uh, scholar and community activist. Um, he specializes in anti-Semitism and counter-terrorism. And he's giving a, it's not part of the seminar series, but he's giving a talk over lunch. So if anybody's interested, we'll pass around um, a sheet. You have to RSVP because we're, there's going to be lunch served. And next Thursday is our final uh, seminar uh, presentation in this semester. And Gerald Steinberg from Bar Ilan University will be speaking about anti-Semitism and issues of uh, non-governmental organizations. So we're looking at the Durban issue and, and the like. So that should also be a, a good uh, seminar. So today it's really a, a privilege um, and an honor to be able to introduce to you Professor Wolfgang Benz. Um, there's basically four institutes in the world uh, that deal with issues of anti-Semitism. There's two in Israel at Tel Aviv University and at Hebrew University. And we are just starting. And Professor Benz is actually the, the director of the perhaps the most substantial one. There's, uh, Professor Benz has over 40 PhD students. There's 35 uh, researchers and full-time professors and assistant professors on the staff. And they've been doing this since 1982. So it's really an honor that our, our senior colleague um, in this small emerging group of uh, institutes that look at anti-Semitism has joined us today. Today, uh, Professor Benz, the title of the talk is Anti-Semitism as a Phenomenon of Everyday Life in Contemporary Germany. Professor Benz, in addition to being the director of the Center for Anti-Semitism in Berlin, uh, was a professor in Munich until 1990 when he joined uh, the faculty in Berlin at the Institute dealing with anti-Semitism. Um, he's a historian of tremendous repute. He's worked on uh, issues of the Holocaust and issues of anti-Semitism in German society and historically, and he's published widely. He has dozens of books and many dozens of articles, so it's really a, a privilege to have a leading expert on the issue here with us, so, Professor Benz. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm <coughs> very grateful and proud being here, but I must confess I'm not the director of the Center of Antisemitism in Berlin. I'm director of the Center of Research on Antisemitism in, in uh, Berlin, and I think it's worthwhile to, uh, to declare this uh, because uh, when I, when I started uh, in 1990 with, uh, with this work, I gave a call to the Jewish community in Eastern Berlin. And the <coughs> chairman was, was, was out, and he got the message. The Association of Antisemites uh, <laughs> were calling for you. Please call back. And he <laughs> called back. <laughs> and I must apologize, uh, giving you a bad treatment in English language. I, I try hard, I do my very best, but it's uh, the true German bad accent you will hear in the next 40 or 45 uh, uh, minutes. My <coughs> Uh, my uh, paper has three uh, chapters. Uh, firstly, definitions and manifestations of antisemitism in Germany, of course. Secondly, antisemitism in the extreme right wing uh, scene in Germany. And thirdly, that's the shortest chapter everyday uh, antisemitism in uh, Germany. Antisemitism as a political and social manifestation is, with good reasons, probably better controlled and as a statutory offense more stringently criminalized in Germany than in any other state. This, of course, does not mean that animosity towards you, Jews as an everyday prejudice 
as an attitude and idiosyncratic behavior has been dispelled and eliminated in Germany. Prejudices transported through traditional stereotypes and cliches, Jewish wealth, Jewish cunning, Jewish greed, Jewish striving for world domination, Jewish dominance in business, politics, culture, and the media, are as much alive in Germany as elsewhere. At best, there is a certain timid reluctance to openly affirm these images of a hostile enemy. Unfortunately, this observation cannot be generalized. Remembrance of the Holocaust is a central component of Germany's political culture. This is clearly evident in the number of people visiting concentration camp memorial sites like those at Dachau, Buchenwald, Ravensbrück, Bergen-Belsen and Sachsenhausen. It is also evident in the overwhelming success enjoyed by the Jewish Museum in Berlin or in the widespread acceptance of the memorial for the murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin. In Germany, it is a criminal offense to deny the Holocaust and it is a career damaging move to publicly profess anti-Jewish views. This is one aspect of the reality. The other is a bare fact that anti-Semitism is widespread as an attitude, as a conviction, as a motive behind certain actions and as a committed criminal offense performed as anti-Jewish propaganda, desecration of Jewish cemeteries, attacks on Jewish institutions, to name but one recent example on a kindergarten, a Jewish kindergarten in Berlin. First, definition and manifestations of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, animosity towards Jews in the broadest sense, confronts both those directly affected and observers alike with problems of definition and perceiving its manifestations. In terms of definition, we need to distinguish between four basic phenomena. Firstly, extending from the Middle Ages into our days, there is a Christian anti-Judaism, a religiously motivated form of resentment against Jews. This phenomenon also includes elements which are culturally, socially and economically determined. Secondly, there is a racial antisemitism that, based on spurious scientific anthropological and biological arguments arose in the course of the 19th century and ultimately led to the Holocaust. The third version of the anti-Semitic prejudice is a contemporary phenomenon, an animosity towards Jews after the Holocaust. The assumption that the Holocaust because the Jews are now recognizable exclusively as pitiable victims must mean the end of all animosity toward Jews was an illusion from the very beginning. This was proven by the pogrom at Kielce in Poland in 1946 and the resentment directed against displaced persons who lived on German soil in DP camps into the 1950s. Besides traditional animosity towards Jews, as was also articulated outside of Germany, a new form of resentment formed in post-war Western Germany, a secondary antisemitism. This secondary form is an independent phenomenon that is less obvious in its manifestation, 
but with a significant latent pot potential. This third phenomenon of animosity towards Jews feeds on the feelings of shame and defensive reactions towards guilt. Resentments against Jews are mobilized not despite, but because of Auschwitz and crystallize around compensation and indemnification payments. For how much longer will we be forced to make amends? Whether the innocent, innocent generations will still have to pay for the Holocaust. These are examples of the kind of battle cries which rung out. And these were accompanied by the suspicion that the Jews were exploiting the genocide to enrich themselves because they seize any opportunity to turn everything into a business deal, a claim that belonged in the arsenal of the defense mechanism and served inwardly to Zeus a guilt-ridden conscience. Secondary antisemitism is initial, initially a West German phenomenon, for it linked into the restitution payments which the German Democratic Republic, East uh, Germany, did not pay. Instead, another manifestation of anti-Jewish resentment took hold there, namely anti-Zionism, which as a fourth basic phenomenon became a decisive component of politics and propaganda in the German Democratic Republic and consequently also in the socialization of East German citizens. These four basic phenomena, religious anti-Judaism, racial anti-Semitism, secondary anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism form the framework for examining animosity toward Jews in contemporary Germany. But further, different... Is there any way to get a speaker so that we could hear you? you know, and, um, maybe, do you want to maybe move closer? Well, I, not, know, I, 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 I have a microphone here. Uh, yes. Shall I cry louder? Do you want to sit here? That might work. Yeah. I noticed other people are having a hard time hearing too. So we can. <laughs> no, I try, uh, I, I try my, <laughs> my very best. But further, differentiation is also required in terms of the intensity of the animosity against Jews. When studying its appearance, we distinguish between manifest anti-Semitism, which expresses itself in attacks against persons, damage to propri property, and propaganda offenses, and a latent anti-Semitism, which is evident in everyday discourse at most as a silent agreement about the Jews, but remains mainly on the level of attitudes and views and is thus above all expressed in opinion polls and only expressed in opinion polls. It is also necessary to focus on the ideological antisemitism that appears as a core component 
of right-wing extremism. This antisemitism is to be distinguished from the other forms through its aggressive refusal to accept historical facts, expressing both a defensive motivation, that means it should not have happened, therefore we deny what happened, and an offensive one, whereby the Jews are considered to have been re responsible for their tragedy, or at least share a complicity in it. Let us call this form the antisemitism of denial and look at its manifestations and how it is disseminated. Denying the reality of the Holocaust, not wanting to accept the murder of six million Jews and the continual arguing of points diminishing the scope of national socialist crimes, this was and remains the domain of a small circle of ideologically committed apologies for the Nazi regime, <coughs> known as the so-called revisionists. Originally, the efforts to correct history counter to the facts and to establish a neo-Nazi image of history isolated the international revisionist cartel of Holocaust deniers not only from the majority of the population, but also from many right-wing extremists who wished to avoid being perceived as neo-Nazis. This situation had changed by the 1980s at the latest. Also, no serious historian belongs to the revisionist circle and the denial of the National Socialist genocide stands under criminal prohibition in Germany. The 1980s witnessed the first attempts to provide the so-called revisionists with an entry ticket to the community of serious academic historians. Employing vague formulations, <coughs> the historian uh, Ernst Nolte in Berlin, for instance, attempted to create the impression that it would be worthwhile to examine the arguments put forward by the revisionists and, moreover, he even had the presumption to make the fantastic claim that these ideological producers of the so-called radical revisionism active in the United States and France and Sweden and Belgium, that is, the deniers of Auschwitz, were superior to the established historians in Germany. In their, I uh, quote Nolte, mastery of the source material and especially their critical ability to verify sources. Uh, quote, and keen, keen uh, words praising uh, ideology uh, producers not able to handle, his, uh, handle the sources uh, really. The attempt to portray the revisionists as serious historians failed as uh, the public uh, deba debate amongst historians in the late 80s uh, demonstrated. This very public uh, debate revolved around the question of whether Auschwitz was merely a reflex to the crimes perpetrated by Stalin and so, with this historical precedent, not singular and lost grave. The debate has left deep scares and created a certain helplessness and disorientation amongst the public, which expressed itself in a growing disinterest for historical problems and issues. 
a German writer expressed publicly what many feel and his views found applause and ignited a continuing argument, an aversion to a subject that touches everyone with painful embarrassment, that makes one feel helpless and awkward, and in response to which normal ways of behavior are not possible. The appeal proclaimed by the German writer Martin Walser in the autumn of 1998, calling for the remembrance of the Holocaust to become a private matter has set off a discussion in which the emotions of many citizens were publicly articulated in such a way that revealed them to be motivated by a desire to reject the need for a collective, not a private, the collective remembrance of Auschwitz. This was not a denial of what had happened, nor a devaluing of guilt. It was though the expression of a wish to have the topic excluded from public discourse and thus to qualify its significance. There are allegedly other problems which are currently more important and moving they are claiming. More crucial than such external mechanisms relativizing the singularity of the Holocaust in which the argument of increasing distance to the event also plays a role, are the other manifestations emerging out of this disinterest and ignorance, such as the erosion of consensus about historical truths and the attempt to construct secondary historical images, an attempt that at the same time seeks to deconstruct a historical culture fostered out of the experience of the national socialist past. Veiled in the stereotypical regret about crimes perpetrated by a small minority, anti-Jewish resentments are mobilized and linked to topics like the debate about the Holocaust Memorial in uh, uh, Berlin, compensation for Holocaust victims, and the suspected Jewish influence in Germany and the world. The construct of Jewish aggression expressed in the insinuations that Jews are perpetrating the accusation of guilt against Germans and deviously procuring unreasonable compensation and indemnification payments is so effective because it corresponds to anxieties and resentments which are in no way restricted to extreme right-wing circles. Such emotions and reactions exist rather throughout society and amongst a minority stimulate a sec the secondary anti-Semitism that arises out the defense mechanism against feelings of guilt and shame at the historical genocide of the Jews. This construct is projected back into history in the often refuted but for that just as eagerly reanimated assertion that there had been a Jewish declaration of war on Germany. Supported by so-called evidence, such as a, as a headline proclaimed by the British Boulevard paper, the Daily Express in March 1933, Judea declares war on Germany, and the letter sent by Chaim Weizmann to the British Prime Minister at the end of August 1939, in which he declared that the Jews would contribute to defending democracy, an argumentation is built up on historical misrepresentations and alleged documentation. This argumentation has the sole purpose 
of proving that the national socialist state was virtually forced into persecuting the Jews out of self-defense. The image of hostile, vindictive, and powerful Jews is propagated in order to keep alive traditional prejudice. It is part of a staging that manipul manip manipulates the historical murder of the Jews and its consequences in the collective memory and consciousness. Second chapter, antisemitism in the extreme right-wing spectrum in Germany. The success, or the small uh, success of the right-wing extremist National Democratic Party in the 2004 state elections in Saxony, that means 9.2% of the electorate provided the party with 12 parliamentary seats. This success triggered an enormous media and public reaction. The comeback of a party that had gained its last seat in a German state parliament in 1968 and had long sunk into insignificance despite the federal government's embarrassing attempt to have it banned uh, three or, four or five uh, years ago, generated speculation that the extreme right were gaining ground on a broad front, not least because of the success achieved by the virtually right-wing radical party German People's Union in Brandenburg. This speculation went so far as to entertain the possibility that the extreme right could also enter the German federal parliament. From its new center of gravity in Saxony, the National Democratic Party has initiated a series of scandals which keep the party in the headlines. Above all, else Germany's post-war culture of remembrance is attacked with crude gestures. Parallel to this, the right stylizes itself into being the victim of the so-called system and voters are promised upright social political engagement from its politicians. One of the most prominent scandals took place in the Saxony State uh, Parliament in January 2005. National Democratic deputies demonstratively refused to take part in an official commemorative ceremony for the victims of National Socialism. It was nothing other an appeal to mainstream society. Another signal in this direction was the march of 5,000 neo-Nazis through Dresden on February <coughs> in, in February uh, 2005. These incidents are part of a campaign of the National Democratic Party to gain media presence through images and symbols launched long before they entered Parliament in Saxony. A two-pronged strategy seems to be at work here. On the one hand, the National Democratic Party consciously seeks to provoke the majority of citizens with the parliamentary faction leader triumphantly claiming that they are a party anchored in the center of society. On the other hand, extreme right-wing activists gathered in the back rooms of uh, Dresden inns create a menacing atmosphere with aggressive slogans calling, for instance, the firebombing of Dresden in 1944 
a, I quote, a singular holocaust committed against the German people, quote end. Analysis of the potential and chances on a regional level, comparisons between Saxony and, for example, the western German growth of North Rhine-Westphalia, as well as the structural makeup of the German party lands landscape, all show that there is little scope for the political growth of right-wing extremism. Explanations of their successes here and there, as most recently in Saxony, not only reveal this limit, however, they also glaringly demonstrate the shortcomings of the democratic parties and the media who basically abandon voters to the influence of the right-wing extremists or response inadequately and inappropriately to their electoral successes. Numerically, the extreme right and neo-Nazis do not play a serious political role in Germany. Their influence lies elsewhere because their slogans pick up on and highlight anxieties and longings foreclosed from the discourse of official political culture, they are having, having a direct impact in society. Antisemitism galvanizes and channels these anxieties and longings. The spectrum of the extreme right is itself differentiated into three scenes, each with its own focus. There is a discourse articulating their ideas and positions, an activist scene spreading propaganda, and a scene targeting parliamentary influence and representation. Antisemitism plays a key role in all three scenes. The terrain of the extremist discourse, discourse covers numerous publication types and internet presence. Here, neo-Nazis, revisionists, and not least Holocaust deniers give their anti-Semitism free reign. For their part, the activists spread their anti-Semitic propaganda through graffiti, provocative acts by the so-called comradeships, and most notably music networks targeting and attracting an audience beyond their own scene. The parliamentary variant of organized right-wing extremism, the political parties of the National, uh, National Democrats, the People's Union, and the so-called Republicans agitates, agitates in official party organs exploiting anti-Jewish resentments, which are given various nuances. The National Democrats operated with codes. They write East Coast, East Coast of uh, the United uh, uh, States, meaning the influence of, uh, of the Jews uh, well, worldwide, the marginalization of the Holocaust, and positive connotations of revisionist literature. The main uh, paper of uh, the People's Union focuses on conspiracy theories, revelations about Jews, and legally ingeniously concealed doubts about the Holocaust. The organ of the Republicans stimulates nationalistic sentiments avoiding overtly crass anti-Semitic constructs. Employing in Rendo, the paper suggests that even arch-conservative circles are dependent upon the Jews. I will now illustrate the action radius of anti-Semitic agitation by the extreme right through three examples. Firstly, in terms of discourse, the instruments and methods employed by Horst Mahler are typical. 
in 2003, Mahler, coming from the extreme uh, left to the extreme right, Mahler left the National Democratic Party because he regarded the party as not being radical enough. He propagates a rabid anti-Semitism and this resulted in him being brought to trial for incitement, which ended in January 2005 with a nine-month nine prison sentence he is currently serving. During the trial, the judge called the defendants endless tirades, pseudo-philosophical justifications of obtuse antisemitism. And this is also evident in the incident that triggered the trial in the first place. Acting as a lawyer for uh, the National Democratic Party in the aforementioned prohibition case before the constitutional uh, German court, Mahler had stated, I quote him, hate of the Jews is a well nigh infallible sign of an intact spiritual immune system, quote end. In recent years, the National Democratic Party has been decisively influenced by Horst Mahler in this <coughs> uh, direction. Activist antisemitism works with appealings and uh, challenges mainly present in the less structured use, German, in the German use scene, it agitates with music, concerts, and the dissemination of recordings. For example, one song by an extremist uh, band has all the characteristics of a call to action. In a translation, the call is Germans rise and resist. Fight the Jew refraff. Germans rise and resist. Place the Jews against the wall. German rise and resist. Buy no more from Jews, then Germany will again only be for the Germans. If we quote end. If we understand antisemitism as a sum of the forms and expressions of animosity towards Jews evident in the four main currents of religious anti-Judaism, racially based antisemitism in the narrow sense, secondary antisemitism as a post-genocidal expression of defense mechanism suppressing feelings of guilt and shame, and anti-Zionism as an eliminatory hatred of Israel, then it is prevalent as a key element in the ideology and agitation of the right, an element that, in the eyes of its adherents, makes sense of the world. There are five main variants of antisemitism understood in this way. Firstly, there is a marginalization and relativization of genocide, doubting the number of victims, playing off the Holocaust against the Allies' conduct of the war, reference to alleged Jewish plans to destroy Germany. Secondly, defaming individual Jews with the connotation of generalization because they are Jews. Thirdly, there is a hatred directed against Israel. Fourthly, attacks targeting the culture of remembrance fostered by a democratic society, imputing Jewish pressure to suppress the Germans through guilt feelings blackmailing the Germans into paying exorbitant restitutions. And fifthly, nationalist or patriot feeling, patriot, patriotic feelings are stimulated by blocking off guilt feelings and indeed reversing the burden of guilt, assertions of an eliminatory 
anti-German campaign. The method of triggering connotations with coded allusions and stimulating existing attitudes amongst the readership through insinuation and word plays without risking legal consequences through precise formulations has a long tradition in extreme right-wing journalism. It is skillfully manipulated by the uh, paper of the German People's Union. There is no doubt that a radicalization has taken place recently, one which is expressed in less ambiguous formulations. One example is a protest staged by the National Democratic Party against the building of a synagogue in Bochum in June 2004. The deputy chairman of the party in North Rhine-Westphalia held a speech in front of 210 demonstrators in which he implied, referring to the Babylonian Talmud, as he claimed, that it was integral part of the Jewish religion to abuse children. He was, and then he declared, we don't want uh, a house of uh, praying for such a religion. He was sentenced to a year prison for incitement. In summary, we may say that the extreme right-wing scene and in particular the National Democratic Party has become more radical in the last few years. And this includes the propagated anti-Semitism. In amalgamation with anti-Americanism, aggressive hatred of Israel serves as an outlet to articulate atavistic anti-Semitic emotions. Parallel to this, secondary anti-Semitism, that is the animosity towards the Jews feeding on the defense mechanisms against remembering the Holocaust, is instrumentalized in connection with the provocative denial of the culture of remembrance. One cannot speak of a new anti-Semitism because neither new content nor new methods are recognizable. What is evident, however, is an animosity towards Jews that utilizes traditional stereotypes but propagates them more openly and offensively as was the case in the past. And now the third and last uh, chapter, everyday antisemitism in Germany. The motives for everyday antisemitism, at least in so far as expressed in letters and emails to newspapers, the Central Council of Jews in Germany, the Israeli embassy, or public contributions to talkback radio or television programs are diverse. One often repeated cause given is the public appearance of a prominent Jewish person, for instance, the president of the Central Council of, or her deputy, or often in connection with this, a press release commenting on disconcerting events like extremist violence or the desecration of synagogues or cemeteries. Those moved to react feel aggrieved not so much because of the event, but its subsequent condemnation. They refuse to be identified with the culprits of such acts, to be placed under suspicion as belonging to a collective of alleged right-wing extremists or neo-Nazis or at the very least 
obstinate reactionaries unwilling to learn from history. They feel wrongly branded by representatives of the Jewish minority. They reject this as insolence and attempt to present the event that triggered the affair as marginal and the Jewish reaction to it as excessive. Another motive is aggrieved national pride. Many Germans no longer want their country and their own sense of national identity to be defined on the basis of the history of National Socialism and vehemently refuse to acknowledge the need to remember and commemorate events they are not responsible for simply because they were born one or two generations later. Dismissal of historical guilt is a need forcibly articulated by many members of later generations, even though an imputation of this kind of guilt is never made, for it is after all nonsensical. Frequently associated with this is another dismissal, one directed at the so-called education dictatorship that is regarded as emerging from the assumption of historical guilt. Here, the representatives of the Jewish minority are perceived as wielding this dictatorial authority in the name of the victims employing as their vassals the non-Jewish majority as representatives of the historical perpetrators. The claim made is that Germans have nothing to do at all with the tragedy befalling the Jews, which has anyway long receded into the annals of history, and sufficiently enlightened about this, Germans have no further need of perceived indoctrination. Long anchored in historical memory are stereotypical notions of Jewish wealth, of Jewish shrewdness in business deals, of avarice and the conviction that Jews are given preferential treatment materially, receiving, receiving unjustified restitution payments or outrageous state uh, subsidies, ultimately at the expense of the majority and so the nation's own welfare. A further motive for animosity towards Jews stems from the narrow-minded anxiety of being swamped with what is perceived as foreign or strange. Jews in Germany are made responsible for this threat to one's livelihood and native culture and are positioned as an alien power. This presses Jews into a role in which they, along with asylum seekers, migrants and foreign criminals, represent all that generates anxiety and disquiet. As a non-integral other, they are banished to those groups excluded from mainstream society. When searching for explanations for the specific manifestations of anti-Jewish resentments in Germany, one needs to consider the motives of those who articulate and instrumentalize antisemitism. A closer look reveals that antisemitism is often used as a means to an end. Only a tiny minority can be said to make up an ideologically committed group of Jew haters in the traditional sense. The majority of those who operate with antisemitic prejudices, stereotypes and cliches are pursuing specific political goals, usually patriotic or nationalistic. The secondary antisemitism expressing guilt feelings 
in relation to Jews may intensify into a redemptive antisemitism. This, of course, when release is sought from the psychological strain of guilt stemming from an awareness of the genocide. Prerequisite for this redemption is, however, a reversal. The Jews are to blame. Their status as victims must be suspended. Perceiving Jews as the perpetrators of crimes allows feelings of empathy for their victims, guilt and disquiet to be replaced with taking side against the Jews. Of course, reasons have to be found for this reversal, for instance, the policies of Israel. Israel's, politic, Israel's political line towards the Palestinians is seized upon, upon as a welcome lever for defaming Jews and withdrawing empathy from them. Criticism of the state of Israel in itself just as legitimate as a critical view of United States foreign policy becomes for many a means for channeling and venting anti-Jewish general, anti-Jewish emotions. But certain slips of the tongue unmask the true intentions and the askew comparisons and recourse to Nazi vocabulary make it clear what is really at issue. Taking the side of Israel's enemies enables alleged taboos and prohibited lines of thinking to be circumvented. Realization that the image of Jews propagated by anti-Semites is a construct that is not dismantled by the reality of Jewish life in Germany marks the starting point of the crucial insight. Namely, that anti-Semitism is a deformity stemming from the maturity society and the Jews are not to blame for anti-Semitism. To know how this construct exerts its impact establishes the prerequisite for a further insight. Images of a hostile enemy are exclusory and be excluding other groups, they generate a sense of community amongst the majority. This turns minorities into vulnerable and undesirable aliens. When Jews are considered as aliens, when asylum seekers are slandered as criminals, when foreigners are perceived as a threat to a harmonious society and vested rights, then this mirrors the aggression and anxieties of the majority. Antisemitism is therefore not to be understood as prejudice against the specific minority, isolated from the broader social context. Rather, anti-Semitism is a prototype of social and political resentment and for this reason primarily an indicator for the current state of a society. I tried to give you uh, a, a little a few on the state of German uh, society dealing with anti-Semitism in everyday, everyday life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk, sir. Um, one thing I was thinking about throughout the whole presentation uh, has to do with this, uh, this law, which is peculiar to Europe compared to the United States, which is that it's actually a crime to deny the Holocaust. And uh, I was reading today in the news that actually the European Union has now converted on a, uh, I guess, a convention regarding it that the Holocaust denial is going to be treated a, a, as a crime uh, across the European Union. And the question is simply this, which is do you think this is a 
good thing. In other words, is it good public policy to make someone uh, who, who is, from a historical point of view, telling a lie, to actually say that that is a criminal thing to do and is deserving of punishment? Or is it is it overly hard? There are those who would say that the way you fight bad language is a good language. What, uh, what uh, shall we uh, do? Uh, creating, uh, creating a public uh, culture who is sufficient for all parts of the society. Uh, I think, firstly, it would be, of course, enlightenment is better than, than punishment. That's, that's, that's uh, clear. We must not discuss about this. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's not a bad idea uh, to make it clear. Uh, we, the majority of the Germans, or following, followed by, by, by other uh, European uh, nations, we are uh, not, not willing uh, to allow anyone to violate victims, uh, confessing the Holocaust didn't, didn't occur, or there was not, uh, there were not six uh, million uh, killed, but only two hundred thousand. Also, we uh, uh, we learned this all over over the years. The methods to uh, harm the victims, and I think this is only only one one uh, point it should be not uh, not uh, possible that's the thinking uh, behind behind this criminalization of of uh, the denying of the holocaust we should not allow uh, to to discuss uh, in an idiotic uh, way uh, which harms the victims uh, if it happened or, or uh, not. This is only one, uh, one anchor of our uh, political uh, culture. And I, uh, I have always problems when, when from the United States, the free United States, is coming the propaganda material for German neo-Nazis with the denying the Holocaust. And that's, for me, that's the end of, of, uh, the, of the freedom of speech and the end of the uh, freedom to, uh, to, uh, to write, uh, to write uh, down uh, what, is, what is not the, the uh, truth. Uh, we, um, we have good reasons to criminalize all uh, those those uh, people for political reasons or what other uh, uh, give any harm uh, to the victims uh, of the of the uh, Holocaust, and uh, it's not helpful uh, to discuss then uh, with brochures uh, coming from neo-Nazis from the United uh, States to drop to, uh, to uh, discuss uh, if it happened or, or not. That's, for me, that's the end of the freedom uh, of, of uh, speech. Islamist hate speech than it will be to protect people from anti-Semitism. So I don't know if you agree with that. Uh, a difficult, uh, a difficult uh, a problem, and uh, the <coughs> this point I think is is a shaming, a shaming for us, for for the for Europeans, because <coughs> the uh, Muslims originally are uh, not racist racist people and have no racist uh, argumentation 
And now, against Israel, they are grabbing into the arsenals of the old-fashioned uh, European uh, racial anti-Semitism. And that's, that's, uh, that's a great, uh, great problem that, uh, for example, the protocols of the elders of science, 100, uh, more than 100 years old, absolutely idiotic and, and uh, not worthwhile, one word. Uh, uh, approved as, as falsification, now are, are uh, a, a weapon uh, from the Islamists against, uh, against uh, Israel, against the Jews. The internet is, is widespread, uh, full with this old-fashioned old, uh, racial, uh, racial attitude against, against the uh, uh, Jews. And <coughs> the uh, propaganda material, uh, the media, Arabic media, are full with, with this uh, uh, hate speeches against, against uh, not only against Israel, but as a collective of Jews. What uh, to do and how to blame the uh, Islamists? In Germany, uh, our problem, I think, is, is not as great as the problems in, in France, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in, in Sweden, because our uh, uh, Muslim population in Germany is mainly Turkish. And we have not the Maghreb uh, problems uh, like uh, France with, with, uh, with, with uh, uh, young, young Arabs in uh, in the uh, suburbs of, of, of the towns. But we in Germany, we can wait uh, for, for the confrontation with, uh, with, with, um, um, is with Islamic uh, propaganda. And, and I have fear that, uh, f for fear that there will be a confrontation uh, between anti-Semites and anti-Islamists. -Isla and I think that that uh, could be uh, not not anything of uh, of health. What we have to await, we must uh, we must try uh, to to uh, keep down by uh, enlightenment uh, anti-Semitism as well as anti-Islamism. So you know, I'm just going to take the prerog prerogative to follow up on this question. I was in Berlin for the first time uh, in November, and I was impressed that when I turned on the television, there were, I think, three uh, Middle Eastern Arabic uh, television stations through satellite. So what impact is not just the radical Islam in the population of Germany having, but I, I think images of uh, Jews and Im images of anti-Semitism, which were banned, uh, that's now, as you said, available on the internet, is also seemingly available on, on satellite television for the first time. So is this only being consumed by Turkish and uh, Muslim immigrants to Germany, or is it now being also consumed by the radical right, and they're seeing images for the first time that were basically banned since the end of the war? I think it's only consumed by, uh, by people who, who uh, know the language and who c you, you, uh, which are able uh, to uh, to understand uh, and this is Turkish the Turkish uh, people as is Arab people and not the German the German uh, majority uh, we are not able uh, to read the, the widespread uh, Turkish uh, Turkish newspapers in in uh, Germany we know there that's uh, uh, that's not not. Uh, there, there is dangerous material uh, within, but it's not not the Germans. The Germans are not reading this uh, these newspapers, and the Germans are not listening uh, to to Arab Islamic uh, uh, channels.
kind of finding sites and whatnot. The question is, um, have you been, have you seen any connections? I mean, everyone's sort of skirting around this issue, but have you seen any uh, definite uh, concrete evidence of people within the NPD or Republic Honor um, having any connections to some of the Islamic uh, fundamentalists at all? I mean, that's happened in this country and in other countries as well. We have sort of a brown-green coalition in addition to a red-green coalition. But are you seeing anything like that? Or is their hatred of the foreigner so great that, that they can't come together or their distaste for Israel? I think it's not 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 much uh, connections between these these uh, groups, but one uh, one event took place five four five years ago at the uh, ground of my university in Berlin, and <coughs> a rally where German neo Nazis and Islamic. Uh, Islamistic uh, people uh, met and made propaganda against Jewish people against Israel. Uh, it was a great, uh, <laughs> a great harass uh, when this happened, and uh, it's all all explainable. But it's it's shaming what uh, what uh, happened on the ground of of the Technical uh, University in uh, Berlin. It was in a building and uh, not under the custody of the president of the university. A student union uh, <coughs> rented the room and, and uh, gave notice there is an in, in internal uh, meeting and a day, a days later uh, we, we, we found this in, in, the, in the news. The, the accident in the newspapers. Unfortunately, uh, it was when our institute uh, had the anniversary, anniversary, the 25th anniversary, anniversary, and the Israeli ambassador uh, was there, and a, a lot of a lot of high-ranking uh, men, and the, the ambassador asked uh, the president of the university last week. We had so, uh, so such nice speeches in the technical university, and now I read the neo Nazis and the Islamic, uh, as Islamic people are meeting on this, on this uh, uh, place. What is what is the truth now? Uh, speaking uh, speaking frankly, it is. Uh, I think it was one one event, and that's not that's not not uh, common. And because German German uh, right wings, her first topic is against foreigners, against uh, against others. They cannot uh, they can only in one point in the hostility against Israel. Uh, a fight together with the uh, Islamic uh, people, and uh, it's uh, the right wing, the, the right wing extremists, the NPD, and the other parties are interested to gain voters, and they cannot gain voters arm in arm with, with Islamic terrorists. It's a very, very growing population. Uh, we have uh, now about 100,000 Jewish people in, in uh, Germany. And the reason uh, is not the fertility of the German Jews. The reason is uh, that the German Democratic uh, Republic, in, in her last uh, moments, uh, decided to invite uh, Jewish people from the uh, territory of the former Soviet Union to come to uh, to uh, uh, Germany, and therefore we have a uh, we have a great migration. Uh, Fifteen years or sixteen years ago, we had about fifty thousand uh, Jews in Germany, and now this uh, this population is doubled by this uh, invitation with a lot of problems 
uh, within the Jewish uh, communities in, in uh, Germany because most of, of these newcomers are uh, unemployed and they, they are uh, in, a, in a religious sense not Jewish. Uh, they must uh, have a Jewish education. They must uh, have lessons in Jewish uh, uh, culture, and uh, they must must uh, have social uh, social uh, care. Most uh, most of them are very high educated, but uh, it's difficult to 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 gain jobs or in in uh, the in the uh, a German uh, market. Uh, I, I think on the example, <coughs> uh, now uh, 93 years old, uh, a Jewish, uh, a Jewish uh, man uh, born in the Bukovina, uh, deported by the Soviets in the, with his mother in, in the 40s, 1941, to Siberia. He lived in Siberia up to 1993. And then he learned it's possible for Jewish, for Jewish people or people from Jewish origin to come uh, to Germany and his sons uh, asked him Please uh, call for this for 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 this possibility, and then the the, the family Wolfenhaut, father and a mother, in the in the late eighties, two sons, two daughters-in-law, uh, for uh, three or four uh, young people from the next generation came uh, came uh, to came to Germany, the, 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 the uh, first generation is absolutely happy uh, being in Germany and they glorify all what, uh, what they see and feel and do. I asked them, is, was there any, uh, any hostile attempt against you? Oh no, not in Germany, never in Germany. All people are so nice here. And when I drive with the bus, the young people, I never saw this. this uh, in Germany, young people are standing, standing up and <laughs> offering, offering uh, the seat. Also kind, all, all it's wonderful. Uh, the sons have uh, have uh, jobs, uh, got as as uh, computer engineers uh, jobs. This is a very success successful family, but only one Jewish person. The, the, the old man, his wife, is, is not Jewish. And this is a part of, of the reality of the growing Jewish society in Germany. There's one second. Yeah. 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 about the right wing anti-Semitism. But uh, we hear a lot about a new phenomenon of the left liberal anti-Semitism, kind of anti-Semitism of the nice people. What are the causes and characteristics of that kind of anti-Semitism? I tried to, to, um, to, to uh, explain to explain a little bit this is the hostility against Israel the empathy for the Palestinians this is this is the, the, the valve for for uh, feelings for undercover undercover feelings it is uh, it is not uh, not good for the career it's uh, not not uh, good for for the image uh, to to be an uh, anti-Semite in in Germany, therefore liberals or le or left left-wing uh, people uh, make make this very uh, very under covered. But I think that it's the problem is overestimated. Uh, 
I, I cannot uh, see uh, the, the left-wing anti-Semitism in, in everyday uh, life. It's only just, uh, just uh, the problem of, uh, of uh, <coughs> taking party against, against Israel uh, stimulated by the by the uh, media and uh, stimulated by uh, the the time which is gone since since the Holocaust in the 60s in the 70s it was absolutely uh, common to demonstrate sympathy uh, with Israel for young people in, in Germany now. Uh, now, uh, in in the in the uh, conflict, uh, this uh, this uh, diminished, but that's not anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, that's that's only they they are anxious to uh, to to be a party, and they are disturbed disturbed what what is happening disturbed what is what they read and and see in 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 uh, television and newspapers i'd like to uh, if you don't mind make a joke in service of a serious point the story going around that that uh, the germans actually did, did decided to lose the war because they were afraid of losing their organizing principle which was actually <coughs> the anti-semites were afraid of losing the uh, and the point of it is, is that there's a psychological dimension to anti-Semitism as well. As long as there's a term, certain type of personality and certain type of psychological need, and we'll organize around a scapegoat. And of course, you know, I'm doing it myself. But it served that purpose very, very well. And I'm wondering whether <coughs> we, uh, in order really to fight anti-Semitism, it's, we have to focus not merely on the realm of ideas that support it before them, but on the psychology. Germany, for example, has had, has been notorious, at least historically, at having extremely high rates of child abuse. And um, I don't know exactly what those rates are now, but those are the sort of, but that's the sort of background that we need to psychologize the psychological subtext for anti-Semitism. Sure, uh, it's a psychological uh, problem, of course. But how uh, to handle a psychological insight into practice? That's the problem. How how can uh, can can we manipulate what we know and see and what is a result of of anti-Semitism research? To bring it in 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 the heads of of uh, the people, that's a, that's a difficult problem. Um, so Germany, of course, for many years has had more than any other European country programs in place to educate the public about anti-Semitism. It's interesting if you look at public opinion surveys. self-reported level of anti-Semitism as revealed through answers to questions like uh, are Jews overrepresented in business, uh, in politics, uh, do they only care about their own kind? So the same sorts of, of stereotypes you were mentioning at the beginning. Um, the levels of anti-Semitism measured by those kinds of uh, markers are actually much lower in Germany than compared to countries like Spain or they compare to Austria just next door uh, or of the population, if you want to think of it that way, do you really believe is anti-Semitic in Germany? And how does that compare to similar percentages elsewhere in Europe, higher, lower, about the same as kind of? 
this is in the last minutes of the seminary, the most difficult uh, <laughs> question. <laughs> and yes, I think the, <coughs> uh, the opinion uh, uh, polls are a very, uh, a very uh, fine instrument now. Uh, in the in, in, in the <coughs> beginning of, of, of uh, this, <coughs> uh, this opinion uh, poll, it was very simple. And uh, do you love uh, Jews or do you hate Jews? Oh, I love uh, Jews if they are uh, nice and, and have a good behavior, was, was the question. Now, now I think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, more, uh, <coughs> it's more sophisticated. The, the, the questions, but uh, it's difficult uh, enough to interpret uh, it. I'm an historian. I'm not. I'm uh, not an <coughs> not uh, a sociologist. As my uh, colleague in the institute, he is very, uh, very clever in in uh, uh, finding the right results behind. Uh, behind uh, question, questions and, and answers. I, I believe uh, this, this uh, opinion uh, polls, especially in Germany, where the Amer Americans as occupation power in 1945 started. And therefore, we have the, the most dense uh, records on, on public opinion in Germany, because it's repeated and repeated and, and uh, repeated. I think they, <coughs> this opinion part give us trends and, and uh, give us uh, a glance of what, uh, what is, what is uh, uh, happening in, 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 in the heads of, of, of uh, uh, people. I'm, I think it's, it's uh, necessary to know this is always a glimpse of the moment. It can change, uh, it, it can change uh, <coughs> very suddenly, uh, and, but for the moment uh, it, it, it shows us uh, what is, uh, what is uh, uh, ground behavior of of as a, of the public, uh, which which prejudices are uh, everlasting, uh, which cliches are not uh, not uh, not being destroyed ever. And this to, to now this thing, I think that's that's a first a first uh, step for arguing a first uh, step. For, uh, for enforcing a little bit enlightenment, what, uh, what, is, what is happening, what, have, what we have uh, to do to keep uh, the, the problem in this uh, dimension as it is. We know we cannot, um, we cannot destroy anti-Semitism, but uh, we, we can watch and we can, uh, and we must, we must try to keep the majority on the right, uh, on the right side, and therefore I think the opinion polls are, are helpful and not more. especially in Germany and even more so in Austria, where I come from. It goes back to hundreds of years and uh, will probably basically not change. What you said is true that for a time after the Third Reich fell, anti-Semitism was so unpopular that nobody wanted to uh, admit to it. And what uh, I think you said there was a, a cover over it. That cover is beginning to loosen up. 
because anti-Semitism is again a quite a popular uh, movement, not just in Germany, not just in Austria, but also in, as you say, in France, in Holland, in Belgium, in, in countries where uh, liberalism and toleration was actually a tradition and they are now beginning to be also anti-Semitic. How do you uh, feel with Germany? Where will it end? In another Holocaust? As I told, I'm a historian. <laughs> and I have to look back and uh, to and to uh, give answer what happened and to say the younger generation what happened and uh, with um, uh, with uh, intention it should never happened it may uh, and never never happened but I cannot uh, I, I cannot cannot say uh, what 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 is what is uh, coming? Uh, I'm helpless. Uh, giving lectures in the moment, uh, the, my my regular lecture on genocides in the 20th century, and this is 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 uh, the point where nothing is learned. The United Nations made up in 1948 uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> the genocide resolution, and now we have a, we have a definition: what is a genocide? But nobody is interested uh, now. Now uh, higher politics. What is happening in Darfur, in 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 Africa? It's uh, it's a genocide, but uh, but uh, the uh, allies of the Sudan say, oh, that's not a genocide. That's interior problems of this country, uh, uh, tribal problems or or such. That's a problem. Uh, denying uh, denying the results of history by politicians, by the people, that's a problem, and not will it, uh, will it appear again, it appears. It appears here and there, in, in, in Bosnia, in, in Darfur, in Uganda, in, uh, in Rwanda, uh, it's one, one genocide uh, per year in, in the average, and uh, the United Nations are debating and sometimes a resolution but mm, I'm very very uh, sorry for this uh, last last uh, statement of, um, of, of the historian who is unhappy uh, about uh, his profession in, in those in those moments that is that is so so uh, difficult to explain what happened to to politicians to say, no uh, this happened of course but what now is happening that's another another case has nothing uh, to do with the Holocaust or with the genocide against uh, uh, Armenians. Very sorry. So, just on a sad note, uh, so thank you very much for a very interesting thank you. Thank you. I, just, I just want to ask you a, a quick question.